Is it possible to have a tragedy or a sad ending that is also satisfying to the audience? It is. It's tricky, though. And what, what a lot of people get wrong is that a tragedy is not like our, the colloquial usage of the word tragic. Um, we're not just pummeling someone down and down and down. Um, for a tragedy to be satisfying, they're actually going up, up, up before they come down. And so that's what a lot of people miss. It's not satisfying to see someone just pummeled to death. Um, it is satisfying to see someone whose flaw is greed get richer and richer and richer as they go up and then get pulled down um, by that own flaw. And also related to that is that their downfall should be primarily about their flaw. It should not be about external things. I mean, their external things will contribute to it, um, but we don't want characters that are merely victims, that are just victims of bad things happening to them. A truly, a, you know, a protagonist is a character um, that isn't just a victim. I mean, they may also be a victim in some senses of the word, but there's a reason why we're putting them on this journey. Um, and uh, there's something in them that needed to be tested. And there's some ways they asked for this journey. They're not just a victim of it. So I think people sometimes when writing tragedies, they just think, oh, this is a sad ending story, and so I'm going to make it a, a tragedy. Um, you have to have an up, up, up. And we also have to see that with the choice they make at the climax, that it's a bad choice. We have to... What you want to experience and what makes a, a tragedy satisfying and kind of delightful in my mind is when I'm rooting with the character despite myself, even though I know they're a tragic figure, I know there's something wrong with them. I can't help myself that there's, it's a little delicious watching them do their thing and, and um, use their flaws to better themselves in the short run. And so I'm, I'm kind of still identifying somewhat. And then when they reach the pinnacle and now they're going to make the climatic choice that's going to take them in the, uh, in the other direction and give them a sad ending, it needs to be a choice where we go, oh, no, 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 why did you do that? You could have had it all. You had it all. You could have walked away with this. Everything was fine. And then you, ugh, you went too far. We have to have that for it to feel satisfying. Otherwise, it just feels like we're just pummeling people. So it's, it's different than the colloquial usage of the word, a tragic figure in life. You know, a tragic hero in a story needs to have an up. Um, they need to hit a triumph and then they need to make a bad, and they need to have to make a bad choice and that brings them the sad ending, not because the, solely because the world was cruel to them. How does the nutshell technique ensure writers a satisfying ending? So it does it in a couple different ways. Um, have you ever heard the expression, the problem in your third act is in your first act, right? So that's getting back to what I'm talking about, that we're, we have to set up things. We have to set up the journey in the first act in order to have a satisfying third act. Um, so that's part of it. If you didn't, you know... Um, if you didn't set it up in an interesting way, you're not going to resolve it in an interesting way. Um, and then the ending, I mean, I would, you know, refer to the third act. So we have the climax and the climatic choice. And we want it to be, as I've said before, you know, they're choosing between rock hard place. They choose banana. A third choice we didn't come, but didn't see coming. Um, so it's unexpected yet inevitable. Now, we're not at a happy ending yet. That's just the climax. You have to finish the rest of the ending there. And so from there, I see a couple different patterns. I see, sometimes I see the climatic choice. It's, it's as if the climatic choice is a um, kind of an umbrella for a new behavior and the protagonist then repeats it in a couple of ways. So for example, in, in Casablanca, uh, Humphrey Bogart's Climatic choice is to stick his neck out uh, to ensure that the Laszlo's get on the boat, uh, on the plane safely. And he does it four different ways. So instead of one explosive climax, it's 
he does four death defying things to get them on there. That's one pattern I see. And then that gets us to the final step, which I'll come back to. Um, the other pattern I see is where we have an explosive climax and then we have kind of falling action, you know, that the, the climax and the climatic choice, they don't yet earn the, the happy ending. If it's going to have a happy ending, um, they have made a step towards change, but it's, it's an imperfect step. They haven't fully dealt with the things that they need to deal with. And so, um, it, in this pattern I see now the, the protagonist has to take care of, uh, has to deal with the consequences of this climatic choice, um, the fallout and whatever has happened from that. So we're going to see that. And then we have the final step, which is the last scene of the movie that the protagonist in is in. And it's where they're going to make a second step. The climatic choice was one step. The final step is a second step they make towards change to finally becoming 180 degrees um, of change from where they were in the beginning emotionally as far as the flaw. And so they're going to make a second step. It tends to be a quieter step. The climax is a big explosive moment. Um, the final step is a much quieter moment and maybe they don't even, you know, they don't even realize they're being watched obviously. And so we are seeing them in their life and often time has passed. I like to imagine, I tell my writers to imagine six months later, um, you know, you, often you literally see that on the screen. It doesn't have to be six months later, but it's, I think it's helpful to imagine like, okay, you had this big climax and the events after that. But maybe they regressed into being the flawed person they were before, or maybe, you know, who knows? It doesn't, you know, you know, they have to live with the consequences of what happened with this climax. So now we see them after time has passed. And so now it tends to be a smaller step. It's a quieter step that's showing us, oh, they really have changed. It wasn't just that one change that they made um, there, that they they made a, you know, they truly are a different person. And so and it's less showy of a moment and it tends to be a more personal moment um, where, um, you know, they are exemplifying that they have fully learned the lesson. And so usually time has passed, although interesting, Casablanca is one example where time has not passed. It's all real time in the third act. So there's no yeah. time break between his climatic choice and the final step of uh, leaving with Renault and saying, you know, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship, right? Um, so we know now that he is a changed man is going to be um, that he can live his life again and be happy and is going to fall in love again. Uh, the man before was too bitter and uh, over his experience and heartbroken. And now this time he pushed her to get on the plane and he feels good about it. He feels good about it and realizes, oh, I can love again. Um, I can't save the world again. I can only do that once. Um, so he's finally free of that. 